Welcome back to One on One, New York's longest running call and show here on WFUV. I'm Kelly Bright alongside Chris Boccia and joining us now is former Steiner Sports Auction Manager and current Golden Auctions Director, Dave Ammerman. Dave, thanks for coming on with us today. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, it's such a pleasure. And I hate to start off on a heavy note, but it is January 26th. That's the day we're taping this interview, exactly one year since the tragic accident in California, which took the lives of nine individuals, including the late great Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna. It's one of those events where everyone remembers exactly who they were with and what they were doing when they heard the news. And Dave, for you, as a lifelong sports fan, how did Kobe's passing affect you at the time? And then now, how does it resonate with you a year later? Um, it's a great question. And having a conversation earlier about this uh, with a colleague who was remembering exactly what he was doing at the time. So we definitely, um, you know, remember exactly the moment. I remember getting a phone call from uh, a former employee of mine who told me about it. And, you know, it took a minute, I think, uh, to sit in. And I actually texted some friends and they were like, no way, you're joking. So, you know, it really kind of was, it was a shock, really, I think, to everybody. Um, you know, just uh, just kind of shows us all how, um, how vulnerable we are, you know, and just kind of puts perspective things into perspective uh, outside of sport. As a sports fan, and a sports memorabilia collector, and as someone who sells memorabilia for a living, um, it definitely changed a lot of the landscape from what I believe to be where we're at now with the memorabilia and the valuation of everything. It's gone skyrocketing, and that was kind of the start of everything, I think. But um, it was just hard because at Golden Auctions, we are partners with the Hall of Fame. This was Kobe's induction year last year. I was actually at the Hall of Fame weeks earlier with the team of guys planning the ceremony and how the Golden Auctions backdrop is going to be there. And they were getting video highlight reel together. And then weeks later, I hear the news of his passing. And um, with COVID, obviously, everything changed as well. But it just put a damper on a lot of people's uh, plans and just really kind of, you know, woke everybody up and just kind of, you know, it just reminded me almost like a Thurman Munson situation, really. But I wasn't around for that one, so. Dave, uh, you mentioned your business of uh, being in the auction business, how this uniquely affects you and, and you say the landscape has changed. Kobe Bryant just being as great as he is, and we're going to talk about uh, the auction that you guys have now a little bit later, but how has it changed the landscape of the auction business? Just specifically a tough year for athletes passing. Hank Aaron, the most recent, I think 10 Hall of Famers in, in baseball since April. So just how is this uh, shaken up your guys' your guys' business at Golden Auction? Um, we were preparing an auction for the induction ceremony for the Naismith Hall of Fame. So we'd already been bringing in some items for Kobe and Tim Duncan and Garnett and some of the guys that were getting inducted. So we'd already started preparing this. But when we heard the news of Kobe's passing, we kind of decided to forego that and speed it up more or less. So what we did is we took everything we were putting together for the end of the year and we put it into an auction right away. And we actually donated a portion of that uh, to the Mamba Foundation and several other Kobe related foundations. So we, we kind of fast tracked all of that because the people who were selling the items were like, hey, we don't want to wait, a, you know, a full year and everything. And usually when someone passes, you get that, um, that spike. So I remember the day he passed, I, I, I jumped online and I, Kobe basketballs were $300 and I was trying to buy a couple. And I thought, ah, eh, you know what, what's it going to go a couple hundred dollars up? I'm not going to get involved. When we ran our auction, we were selling basketballs only two months later for three to $5,000. So we're looking at a 10 X valuation jump and Kobe signed a lot. He was an upper deck guy. He was Panini. So there's no shortage of Kobe Bryant autographs. He was signing for 20 years with these companies. Um, but even so, when he passed, the values went 10 times. And obviously, after that, uh, coronavirus and everything kept people at home. So that suddenly led to this surge of online buying and spending and kind of the market's uh, instability as well during that time. And our business is going to be still around or all the restaurants going to shut down. I think combined with all of that, people started dumping more and more money into memorabilia and saying, hey, I feel safer with buying a signed piece of memorabilia or a trading card, as opposed to investing in this restaurant or that hotel that maybe isn't going to be around in a year from now. So um, a lot of investor dollars came in and with investor dollars, people are, they can spend a lot more A and B, they're not as um, emotionally driven. So they're kind of using that, um, they're using that 
uh, those examples you see online and the values going up and they're kind of following those trends. And we see unprecedented value raises recently, two to three times value increases in weeks. Um, it's, it's really incredible what's going on. Yeah, definitely. And I think it kind of showcases just how impactful somebody like Kobe Bryant or, you know, as Chris mentioned, Hank Aaron, um, how impactful they are on sports fans and their lives. And beyond just the sport they play, I think Kobe Bryant's an example of someone who trans his legacy transcends the sport. So can you talk a little bit about how something like, you know, buying like a, a signed autograph, a card, a, you know, a used jersey, how does that kind of help? How does that, what does that mean to a fan and how does that kind of preserve a legacy that, that someone as great as Kobe Bryant has made throughout his sport and throughout his other endeav endeavors, like, you know, obviously the way he treated his daughters and, and you know, mom mentality and all that. Yeah. Um, memorabilia, the whole business is all about connectivity and emotional connection with either a player or a time or a moment in sports. Um, you see those signs 16 by 20s where you have Kobe in the dunk contest in 97 or Kobe in the finals or Kobe hugging the trophy crying. You can relate to that, or at least the people who can relate to that, they want to buy it and they want to memorialize that moment, put it on the wall so they can forever look. I've got McGuire behind me when he hit his 60 second home run for me as a as a boy watching that, that, that's what sticks to me. I don't buy and resell that. That goes on my wall because I want to display it. And every time I look at it, it reminds me of, of being a kid again, really. So I think that's what memorabilia comes all down to, right? Um, a lot of these collectibles I've studied, things that people bought from their childhoods that they can relate to or what kind of stays in, in stock more or less. And that's kind of what uh, appreciates as the people turn from teenagers into college now they're grads they have some money and you see these cycles repeat themselves for for decades really it was Joe DiMaggio in the 90s then Mickey Mantle a little bit later on now you have the new generation of basketball and with basketball uh, and Kobe specifically it's international it goes way beyond Los Angeles way beyond the Philadelphia area where he grew up um, in Asia people love Kobe and Kobe was a world traveler as well so he left an imprint on so many, as evidenced by his funeral uh, last year, it was just an amazing spectacle of people. And a lot of people who decided to buy and sell Kobe items uh, on golden auctions, particularly, they were not even from this country. So it was a big, it was just a big combination. It really shows uh, how the NBA has gone worldwide, uh, more so than really any of the other sports right now. Um, and basketball, particularly since the dream team in 92 got into the Olympics and put on a show and everyone's like, who are these guys from the U S and we want to play in the NBA. Um, and it really kind of connected the world of sports uh, almost even in a bigger way than soccer did because soccer never really made it to the U S as much as some of the other countries that were the guys are absolute diehards. So I feel like NBA right now is really the universal worldwide sport in so many different countries. Uh, and obviously one of its biggest superstars to pass at a young age, uh, like Kobe Bryant, it seems to make sense to to want to go and get those memories that you know you're not they're not going to be able to continue to be made unfortunately. So people went in and just it's all about supply and demand that determines value of items. And everybody who wants to buy the balls at the same time, the values will inevitably go up. And um, obviously, as you said, the connection with uh, his daughter and family, uh, we did a lot for the foundations as we were donating money. But one person individually. Uh, from LA, he had a jersey signed by Vanessa and Kobe. It was kind of unusual. And it was a painting that was made of the two of them. And then going back to when he did it, you're probably thinking like, this was a weird piece or, you know, it's just kind of unusual. And we got $25,000 after his passing for that, for that piece. And we donated, um, we donated a good percentage to the charities as well. So uh, it was good to see his memorabilia being sold to raise some money and uh, everybody getting involved for that cause. Dave, it's difficult to look at athletes who currently and, and sort of stack them up against former athletes. I'm, I'm curious your perspective on somebody like Tom Brady, who's going to go to the Super Bowl again, get a chance at a seventh ring uh, now in Tampa Bay. He faces Patrick Mahomes, who's somebody who I, I expect that you'll be selling a lot of memorabilia of uh, in, in future years. Your thoughts on just some of the, the current athletes, even look at LeBron James, who's still doing it. Um, guys that you probably expect to, to be selling their autographs for a long time or, or there any of their memorabilia? It's interesting right now, the current athletes, and it's been the trend. I've been watching it for a while. I mean, we'll go back to the late 80s when everyone was buying Doc Gooden and Don Mattingly and uh, Eric Davis and Daryl Strawberry, right? Those are the big names. And even in the NBA, Matumbo and other guys like that through the 90s, um, people were spending astronomical amounts on these guys 
comers and everybody wants to get into the next big thing. Um, and then now with these players, uh, Brady's kind of at the end of the run, but what Brady's done is unprecedented. And I don't think unless Mahomes uh, can match what he's done, I don't see anyone doing that. Um, I wish that people could kind of see those things and put maybe less stock in some of the up and comers and put more money and investment into the guys that are proving themselves. Unfortunately, with memorabilia, it's about the connection and the emotion to buy and spend. And it's really about uh, current things as well. Um, a football from a game on Sunday night that comes to auction on Monday is going to sell for more than a football that, from the 70s that no one can sit around and remember that game in that moment. So they'll spend five times the value on an item from last weekend than they will for an item that's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, so I see a lot of that where, you know, you have to look back and say, hey, let's fast forward 30 years from what I'm buying now and see, is this still going to be a good buy or is this going to be uh, like buying Doc Good? You know, and obviously those careers were derailed. So, you know, and talking about Mahomes and Brady, they've already done, uh, I mean, obviously Brady, but even Mahomes, I feel like if he played another year or not even <laughs> all famer almost at this point, um, almost like a Mike Trout, you know, after his first so many years. Right. So I, I feel like that's not a bad buy, but when you look at the price, Mahomes rookie cards were going for $5,000, some specific cards a year and a half ago, they're going for 150 to 200,000, those same cards. Um, a Tom Brady rookie just sold for over 500,000 in auction. Now that makes a little bit more sense because I mean, if he wins or not, Tom's already cemented his place in history, but again, you're not going to get those ultra high values unless the buyer says, I love Tom Brady, or I think this is a good buy. So you still need that connection. Um, and I just, as long as the guys buying it are getting rid of it at a reasonable time and, you know, kind of capitalizing on the swings, if they hold too long and like the players as well, um, if Tom Brady came out next year and sold his entire collection of Super Bowl rings and everything, it would sell for more than if Brady sold it in 30 years from now, because right now, which would you rather have Tom Brady or Joe Montana? I think the answer is Tom Brady, but I think you'd rather have Montana maybe 25, 30 years ago, right when he was winning. So I think the emotion is going to drive the pricing. Um, but from what I've seen in the uh, trends, I think, oh my gosh, this is guy spent 200,000. It's crazy. And then he'd go and flip it and sell it for 500,000. I think, well, maybe he was onto something. So um, we've just seen prices keep going up. People want the best items. So if you're buying the best guys, uh, you're in pretty good shape. The best items, you can pretty much name your price. And that's what people are kind of doing now. We're talking to Goldman Auctions Director Dave Ammerman. And, and Dave, you know, we're talking about these big items, big names. Obviously, you mentioned Kobe Bryant earlier. And one item that's gotten a lot of news and press lately is the 63 Impala. Um, obviously, it was given to Kobe Bryant from his wife, Vanessa, in 2006. Reports saying that it could reach up to, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. What makes a car like this or an object like this so special and something that, you know, people are willing to spend so much money on? Uh, again, that personal connection. Now, this more so than a signed jersey. You know Kobe touched it when he signed it, but it's really not so personal. This is a gift from his wife that he had for many years. He had it for about six or seven years. Um, so when you're driving in the car or you're just looking at it, you're feeling like Kobe did driving. So you're getting even closer and closer to the athlete. And it's all about getting as close as you can. Um, the car right now, it has a bid of $160,000 in auction, which would place the final bid a little over 190000 with the premium right now. And we still have uh, a good while to go here ending uh, this weekend. So um, I anticipate a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, sale easily. And I've had many people email of interest saying they want to get in and bid. You have to qualify to bid. You can't just come on our site and spend $200,000. We've got to do some checks. So there's some other interested parties. And um, what better way to get closer to Kobe than his actual vehicle? And the car's a collector to begin with. So, um, you know, you, you get to touch it. It's a, you can, it's a little bit more practical than, say, a card that goes in the closet, never comes out. And you're going to spend, there's a Kobe rookie card in the auction that's at 220000 So, you know, I guess weigh it out and say, would you rather drive the Impala around or would you rather put it in the closet? Another one I want to ask you about is some of these other athletes this year that have passed, uh, Tom Seaver, Don Larson. I don't know if you guys have anything um, memorabilia wise, but it, your reaction this year to what's been a lot of passings, unfortunately, morbidly um, beyond Kobe a year ago today. It's just been a really unfortunate year in that in that uh, department. Yeah, definitely historically more than I can remember. Uh, every year we kind of have an athlete or two pass. Um, and in past years, it's only been a couple, but this year it just seems like it's two or three, four times maybe as many um, in the past years. 
Uh, I did see a big raise on Joe Morgan and some of the big red machine as we had several uh, members of the big red machine pass. Those were kind of stagnant collectibles for a while, um, but they kind of two to three times the valued win when that happened because to put together the top eight big red guys, that's that's tougher to do every day now. Um, so that's something that I saw. Uh, Larson, we got a big uh, inbound of consignment when he passed, but I actually sold Larson's uh, estate and collection while he was living. While I was at Steiner, we had an auction uh, about four years ago where we sold his collection with the estate of Yogi Berra right when Yogi passed. And I think with Larson is he was, he was in his 90s. He when a player gets to that age, you can kind of foresee this happening. So people kind of stock up and they wait for that day, but it wasn't really like, oh my gosh, like we're, when Kobe passed, nobody saw it coming and you didn't have 40 years to prepare and build and, and get him to sign. Larson, uh, and I know this personally, is when he would go to the mail every day, he would see in the mail, uh, can you sign this? Can you sign that? And that's kind of how he earned his living. And I think he was doing it for $10, $20 an autograph. So a few real keen uh, savvy collectors realized that kind of caught on. And, and remember Don in his later years, um, you know, anything these guys could do for, for money, these athletes back then were working part-time in the off season, weren't paid like they are today. Um, mm -hmm. He would sign as much as he could just to, just to keep the bills really uh, being paid. So um, the guys kind of caught on to that and they were sending him programs and yearbooks and all sorts of things and jerseys where he was writing stats. So a lot of them came out right after he died and we listed them and, I wasn't really overly impressed with the value raise. I think people anticipated a lot. Um, but, yes, very unfortunate year overall with athletes passing. And I think uh, for us, you know, it was just definitely, um, you know, it's really unfortunate when you have connections with these athletes and things like that. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like over this long period of time you've been involved in this industry, you've probably made some really cool connections. You know, you've been collecting sports memorabilia for over 25 years now. How did you first get started with this sort of, you know, niche hobby, this niche part of the sports industry? And what's, I guess, the coolest piece of, you know, sports memorabilia you've come into contact with? Hmm. Well, I think as any uh, child uh, who wants to collect and has brothers and my older brother was collecting cards and things like that, I just kind of wanted to do what my brother was doing, really. I hadn't even watched too much and wasn't really interested in it at all. So for me, um, it was very interesting to just, acquire the cards. And I remember my grandmother as a kid uh, taking me to the card store. She's no longer with us. So all those good memories um, got me into it. But for me, I've always been driven by business and money and things like that. That's always just been the way I always thought. Uh, in my spare time, I wasn't listening to music. I was kind of going on eBay and saying, how can I turn five to $10? So for me, I, I saw cards as a good way to do that. And it was, it was fascinating. I was doing $100 trades in middle school with people on forums, um, and it just kind of became more and more of a business to me than, than the passion. I made many mistakes in my collecting days buying who I liked, Mark McGuire, for example, as opposed to who was sensible, Jordan and other things like that. I've told myself since the 90s, oh, just buy Jordan, buy Jordan. Obviously, if I listen to myself um, financially, it'd be a better thing, but everybody's going to do that with collecting. You're going to still buy what you like and connect with. I'm not going to go buy maybe Boston Red Sox players because I'm a Yankees fan, right? So I don't necessarily want to root for those guys to do well. So, you know, that's, that's part of being the fan. Um, so I just kind of develop that uh, connection with the cards and from investing in players I'd go out and buy this guy and now I want to watch him maybe I pulled this card in a pack and I didn't know much about him but now every time he's on tv I'm watching the game and I want to see how many points he puts up and you know so you kind of work backwards into the sports I think we're going to see people and trust me I have these combos where these investors sound like they're technical tech tech guys and they've never watched a sports event in their life and they have money and they see how to make money with it so I think are going to get into watching the leagues and the sports backwards by buying a hundred thousand dollar card from someone they heard is good and then now rooting them on and maybe going to the games and maybe uh contributing to the league and and, and because they're watching the game they're ordering the nba pass or things like that so um that's kind of how i got involved and i see people getting involved that way now as well and it's great for it's great for the sports it's great for the hobby there's so much new money the supply in my opinion almost always away the demand you can always go find a jordan rookie card you can always find a ken griffey jr they printed so many but now you have guys that aren't and maybe never even heard of michael jordan or never really watched him they're buying his cards because they see it's a good investment so we're seeing all this demand increase and the supply suddenly decrease and as anyone knows that will drive uh, the values upwards and uh, it's really it's amazing. I mean, Golden Auctions last year went from 30 million in sales to 100 million in sales in one year, in a year where 
we had a pandemic where a lot of people were unemployed, where we were wondering where the money's coming from, but uh, it just seemed to be the right hobby for people to do with their spare time. And, uh, you know, the, the price of everything has is, is gone up astronomically. It's really, it's, you know, we're very fortunate. Definitely. And Dave, A Dave Ammerman, Director of Golden Elite Auctions, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. The 2021 Golden Elite Auction can be found at goldenauctions.com and will close January 30th, January 31st. So make sure you go check that out as well. But Dave, thank you so much for coming on. All right. Thanks. It's been a blast talking to you.